Truth in History with Charles A. Jennings. Welcome to Truth in History. In this lesson today, I would like to talk about the Ark of the Covenant and its contents. Now, we know that the Ark of the Covenant was a physical object. It was made out of wood and gold. The Bible tells us it was made out of shittim wood. Some scholars say that that was actually acacia wood. And that acacia wood were, was the actual tree. But the shittim wood phrase was the location where these trees grew. Regardless of the fact, we know it was made out of two different contents, wood and gold. And the wood represented humanity. And the gold represented divinity. So it was an ark of the covenant that God had made with the children of Israel. Now I want to start our scripture reading in Hebrews chapter 9. And understand the Ark of the Covenant in a New Testament context. Here we see in Hebrews chapter 9 verse number 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. You notice it had ordinances of divine service, but it had an earthly sanctuary, something that was made by the, man, uh, the hands of man. And there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick, and the table of showbread, or the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was Number one, the golden pot that had manna, and Aaron's rod that budded, number two, and number three, the tables of the covenant, or the law that God had given Moses on Mount Sinai, and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now, it's going back to the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 25, we read this in the book of Exodus. Exodus 25, beginning with verse number 9. 25, 9. 25, 8, excuse me. And let them make me a sanctuary, God is speaking, that I may dwell among them according to all that I show thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall ye make it. And then in verse number 10, it starts the description of the Ark of the Covenant. And they shall make an Ark of Shittim wood. Then it gives the dimensions. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. Now, different scholars give different dimensions to the Ark of the Covenant. Now, some say it was four feet long, two and a half feet wide, 
and two and a half feet high. Others say that it was approximately five feet long and three feet wide and three feet high. But regardless, it was made. And the discrepancy comes in because of our lack of understanding according to the measurements of a cubic. Some say a cubit was, I think, somewhere around 25 inches. But regardless, we know that it was made according to the commandment of God. Now, it had a mercy seat over it. And in Exodus 25 and verse 22, well, starting with 17 down through 22, gives the command to make this mercy seat and the cherubims that was to be a lid or a covering over the Ark of the Covenant. And this is the purpose of the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. In verse number 22, Exodus 25, the Lord is speaking and He says, And there I will meet with thee. I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the covenant, of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. Number one, he says, I, referring to himself, I will meet with you. That's a promise. He says, I will commune with you. And who did he commune with? He actually only communicated or communed with Moses. Why with Moses? But yet he is saying, I will commune with you concerning all the things that pertain unto the children of Israel. So number one, God made this promise and He obligated Himself to speak and to speak concerning the children of Israel. No one else. And He said, all the things that I will have you to do, not only right there at Mount Sinai, but throughout the history of Israel in the Old Testament. And he says, I will commune with thee from between the two cherubims, which are upon or upon the top of the ark of the testimony. Why is it called the ark of of the testimony. Now I'm not going to look up all these scriptures, but it's called the Ark of the Covenant. It's called the Ark of the Testimony, the testimony referring to the law that God gave Moses to give to the children of Israel. And also the testimony of their marriage to God Almighty, Israel's marriage as recorded in Exodus 24. So the Lord and Israel became husband and wife. And he says, I want you to take this covenant and I want you to put it inside the ark of the covenant. The words of this covenant, I want you to put that those tables of stone in the ark and it shall be called the ark of the covenant or the ark of the testimony. And you notice in chapter 24 of Exodus, it says, behold, the blood of the covenant. This is Exodus 24 and verse number eight. 
And verse number seven, and he took the book of the covenant and read in the audience and said, all that the Lord has said, will we do and be obedient. So there Moses, as the mediator of the old covenant, was the one to commune with God on behalf of all Israel, the whole nation. So Moses is the mediator of the old covenant. And this covenant of law, the two tablets of stone, was to be put in this ark as a testimony, a reminder that throughout Israel's history in the Old Testament, that they made a marriage covenant with God Almighty. And that was proof. It was evidence that they were obligated to be a faithful wife unto the Lord. So, it was the mercy seat. It was the ark of the Lord. The ark of God. It's referred to in different phrases throughout the Old Testament. Now, it represented the presence of God. Turning to 1 Samuel chapter 4, 1 Samuel chapter 4, it tells us this. Now, in recalling the history of Israel, while they were encamped at Shiloh, they had a war with the Philistines. And they lost the war. They lost the first battle. And they lost 4,000 men. 1 Samuel 4 and verse 3, And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore hath the Lord smitten us this, this day before the Philistines? Let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it come among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. They actually took it to war. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring them from thence the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, which dwelt between the cherubims. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Now, what type of men were these two sons of Eli? They had the ark. But look at the leadership. The leadership was Hophni and the, the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. But these were corrupt men. They were serving as priests but they were lying with the women, full of lust. They were scamming the people of their money. They were taking the animals, selling them at the feast days, and making a lot of money. Now, do, do those two sins remind us of an element among Christianity today? Immoral relations, immorality, I'm afraid to say it, 
but we know it's true because we've seen plenty of evidence among Christian ministry. Not all, of course. Immorality among the leadership, among Bible college presidents, professors, ministers, evangelists, it's, it's obvious, but it's been all over the news in, in days gone by. And this prosperity message, you know, send in your offering to me, and I promise that God will send a tenfold offering back to you. They're scamming the people by doing that. So the two sins of the priesthood that were back there in 1 Samuel chapter 4 is come around, all the way around once again. But it's been done in ages past. But yet they had the ark. They had the symbol that was the presence of God. They had that object, that box, that chest. Whereas God promised that He would speak between the two cherubims. Now my question is this. Did they take not only the ark, but did they take the mercy seat to war against the Philistines? Because it says this, they, they came together and they recognized that the Lord had smitten them against the Philistines. And they said, let us fetch the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it cometh among us, it may save us out of the hand of the enemy. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims. So the implication is that they took not only that chest of the ark, but they took the covering also, which would be the mercy seat where the two angels, the two cherubims, up made out of pure gold, was mounted on top of the ark. And they took this to war, and they still lost. And guess what? The Philistines took the ark, and no doubt the mercy seat because they had an empty religious shout. They had an, a sham and their belief. They had a problem which was spiritual and it turned into physical defeat with the Philistines. Corruption and sin and iniquity was in the camp. And also, they had corrupt leadership. As the ministry goes, there goes the church members. There goes the congregation. So we must be careful. We can take something that is sacred and defame it and use it as a, a, a token, proof, we can use it as something that's magic. That I've got this. God is with me. I can do anything and still win. And you can even take the name of Jesus. Of which the world, the church world claims today. And still be a corrupt church. But yet we say, we have Jesus. We have the author and finisher of our faith. But yet we still are defeated in this corrupt culture in which we live.
you know, we, we use the name of Jesus. We even use the scripture and claim God is with us. And we still are being overrun by this sinful culture in which we live. Going down in, in 1 Samuel chapter 4, the ark of God was taken. Israel was defeated. 30,000 footmen died. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas were slain. They were slain. Leadership failed while they had the ark. They had the means by which God would commune with them. And they still failed. They were defeated by the Philistines. Well, there was a man that was saved, an Israelite, a Benjamite. He survived the war, and he ran back to tell the bad news to Eli. And the bad news was, Israel is fled before the Philistines and a great slaughter among the people. And Eli, your two sons are dead. And the ark of God is taken. They put it, the Philistines took it, and they put it in the house of their God, Dagon. But yet it still had power within it. And old Dagon couldn't stay on his pedestal. He fell. Even among the ministry of Eli's two sons, the ark did not save them. But yet in the camp of the enemy, it created chaos, confusion. It was in the wrong place. Have you ever given thought to the fact that we Israelites, that God has given His Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, His Holy Spirit, his Bible, His Word, and we have defamed it among the heathen and created a confusion. We've wasted it. We've defamed it. We've given it to cultures that they retain their culture and they take our sacred things, and they mix them together. They synchronize them together. And it doesn't work. And they still turn against us. Just a thought. When Eli heard the word of his two sons and the ark being taken, and 30,000 footmen killed in Israel. He fell backward off of his seat. He was apparently a very heavy man. He was blind, the Bible says. He was heavy. He fell back, broke his neck, and died. Now I want to start reading in verse 19. And his daughter-in-law, Phineas, his wife, was with child near, near to be delivered. 
And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself, travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The Lord is departed from Israel, because the ark of God is taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is is taken. It's now in the house of a foreign god of the Philistines, in the house of Dagon. What a shame. That which God gave Israel, whereby He would commune with them, is now in enemy territory. Now, Ichabod, I hope, I pray, O oh God, let that never be written over the body of Christ. Let it never be written over the body of Christ. But yet we see in the book of Revelation where Jesus is speaking, I think it's to the church at Ephesus said, you're lukewarm. I will spew you out of my mouth. Well, that's getting rid of something. It's repulsive. It tastes bad. He's going to spit it out. Now, in Deuteronomy chapter number 10, I want to bring this out. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 1. At that time the Lord said unto me, unto Moses, Hew thee two tables of stone like unto the first, and come up unto me into the mount, and make thee an ark of wood. And I will write on the tables the words that were in the first tables, which you break, and thou shalt put them in the ark. And I made an ark of shittim wood. Now Moses is speaking and he said, I made the ark of shittim wood and hewed two tables of stone like unto the first and went up into the mount having the two tables in my hand. And he wrote on the tables according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord spake unto you in the mount of the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly, and the Lord gave unto gave them unto me. And I turned myself and cast down from the mount the and put the tables in the ark which I had made. And there they be as the Lord commanded. Now Moses twice said in this passage, I made the ark. That's what he said. But in Exodus 31, in verse number 7, but I want to start reading with verse 1, Exodus 31 and 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, I have called by name, Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom, understanding, and knowledge in all manner of workmanship, to devise cunning works, to work in gold, silver, brass, in cutting of stones, to set them, carving of timber, to work in all manner of workmanship. And I, behold, I have given with him Aholab, the son of Ahishamah, of the tribe of Dan. 
and in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, I have put wisdom that they may make all that I have commanded thee, that they may make all that I have commanded thee. Now, it's this man, Bezalel, and his helpers that's making the Ark of the Covenant. The tabernacle of the congregation, the tabernacle of the congregation, the Ark of the Testimony, the mercy seat that is thereon, and the furniture of the tabernacle. Now, in Exodus, the Bible says that the Lord told Moses, I have anointed this man Bezalel and these others, this man from the tribe of Dan, Bezalel being from Judah, I have anointed him in wisdom, knowledge, talent, this gift of workmanship that he's going to make the tabernacle, he's going to make the, the covenant, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, he's going to make the mercy seat and all the furniture. Now, who made it? This is the way I see it. In the earthly part, in the human, in the fleshly, in the physical, Bezalel and this company of men made the physical Ark of the Covenant and the other things, the mercy seat, the furniture, etc. And God anointed him and gave him the ability to work among wood, silver, gold, etc. But in Deuteronomy 10, It would have never, this, all these parts, these physical things, would have never been made without Moses, who was the messenger, or the mediator, or the intercessor of the covenant between God and Israel. You see, Moses says, I made it because he stood in the office of mediator. And it would have never been made physically if it had not been for Moses' relationship made by God, appointed by God, to be between God himself and the people of Israel. So the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant would have never come into being unless there would have been a man, a mediator between God and man. Now, what was in that Ark? We read in Hebrews, we read in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 9, that there was the Ark of the Covenant overlaid with gold, wherein was the golden pot of manna. Now, we talked about the tables of content or, or the tables of the law, which was part of the content of the ark. And Moses received the law. Now, who is the law today? It's not Moses. What was that law all about? In Hebrews chapter 8, we read these words. Verse 
Number one, now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched. We no longer need Moses now. Now it's Jesus Christ, a minister of the tabernacle, a high priest which is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty of God in the heavens. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices wherein it is of necessity that this man have also also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Verse 6, But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. You see, that law that God gave Moses to put in the ark, and the marriage vow that was physical, going into a physical box. And it was the covenant, the old covenant, the old Mosaic covenant between God and Israel. But now Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant of a new covenant. And he goes on, the writer of Hebrews goes on to say in verse 8, for finding fault with them. He said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now it's Jesus is the law. Jesus is that covenant. No longer Moses. Now it's Jesus. Also, what else was in that ark? A pot of manna. Now in Exodus 16, the Bible tells us that the Lord told Moses, I want you to take some of that manna and I want you to put it in a pot and save it as a reminder to the children of Israel that I will feed you. I will not let you starve. I am your sustenance. I am your provision. I am your bread. But what did Jesus say concerning this? You see, we no longer need a physical pot of manna. Jesus came along and said this, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and gives life unto the world. He's referring to himself. Jesus is the new manna, fresh manna. Verse 35, and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. That ark of the covenant is Jesus himself. And it is the law of a new covenant with the house of Israel. And the manna, which is the new, not the old. And this 
is the new manna, the Word of God. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Verse 48, I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. Verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give him is my flesh, which will, I will give for the life of the world. So he's the law that's in the covenant. He's the bread. He's the new manna. He's the living word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. And the word was made flesh, John, 4, John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father. You see, Jesus is the law. Jesus is the manna within him. And that third thing, Aaron's rod that budded. Numbers chapter 16. Numbers chapter 16. We see a very interesting story. Without reading a lot of scripture. The story is about the rebellion of Korah. Apparently Korah and others became jealous of their position. And they were priests. They were of Levi. And they came to Moses and complained. 16.1, Now Korah, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, uh, yeah, Dathan and Abiram, and others, sons of Reuben, took men, 250 princes, men renowned, and they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. Competition in ministry. Competition in the priesthood. And they said, why can't we serve like Aaron? But in verse 9, Moses said, Seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation and to minister. Then he goes on, And he hath brought thee near to him and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee, and seek ye the priesthood also? You've already of the house of Levi been appointed and set aside by the Lord to minister unto the people, and now you're seeking Aaron's position. Well, long story short, Moses prayed, let the earth open up and swallow these rebels. And that's what happened. And then there was a challenge. Moses said, I want princes from all 12 tribes of Israel to bring a rod unto me. Bring a rod. And 
guess what? He said, let's see what happens when we determine who is appointed to be the high priest and his family. And we know that Aaron's rod budded in chapter 17. And it came to pass that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness and behold the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded it brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. A dead rod or a dead stick, 12 of them, placed in the tabernacle and overnight one of them budded, brought forth buds, blossoms, and even produced almonds. That was the proof that Aaron was the anointed high priest of Israel. Now, what does that mean to us? It was supernatural life, supernatural life that determined which man was the high priest. Now, out of all the high priest, of all those that have claimed to be the high priest, because Jesus talked about the thief and the robber climbing up some other way. But what did Jesus say? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Now the proof that Jesus Christ and in, in Him is life and in Him only is life His rod budded symbolically because when he was laid in that grave, he is the only one that came back to life. He is the only one that claimed to be the Savior and the Redeemer and the Messiah of his people Israel that came back to life. So within Jesus is contained the law. He gave us a better covenant of law. We under the new covenant of grace and mercy. And also within him is the word of life, the bread. He said, I am the bread of life. And also, that third item, Aaron's rod that budded, within him is life. He overcame death, hell, and the grave. And he's the only one. So we see where the writer of Hebrews, talking about the second tabernacle, the second covenant, the second mediator of between God and Israel of everything new, new covenant of law, new bread of life, not the old manna that went stale and not Aaron's rod that budded, but Jesus' resurrection from the grave. That's the contents of the Ark of the Covenant. Because Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am, he said. So Jesus within him is the Ark. We don't need a physical Ark. And those Christians teaming up with the Jewish rabbis in Jerusalem wanting to make another uh, temple 
and the furniture and the Ark of the Covenant. It's an abomination, folks. It's an abomination. It should not be. Jesus is our covenant. He is our mercy seat. Because the Bible tells us that the Lord told Moses, I will commune with you from that mercy seat. Well, what does Hebrews 1 1 say? God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. <coughs> He's not speaking from the mercy seat, a physical mercy seat of gold. He's speaking by his Son, Jesus the Christ. Now, in Matthew chapter 27, to bring this to a close, in Matthew 27, the Bible tells us when Jesus died, it said, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And it exposed the fraud of that Judaistic Talmudic system. There was no ark. There was no mercy seat. And there was no glory cloud in that temple of Herod. It was a fraud that the Scribes and, and, and high priests, and Pharisees and Sadducees were perpetrating upon the people of that day. It was gone and had been gone for hundreds of years. So the Lord knew to get rid of that, possibly back in Jeremiah's day when he took it somewhere and no longer to be found. We don't need it because Jesus is the true tabernacle. Jesus is the new Ark of the Covenant and its contents, the covenant of law, Aaron's rod that budded, and the pot of manna. So He is all and in all. We worship not idols. We worship not relics and fetishes like Christianity is going these days in trying to rebuild a temple and all of its contents. But Jesus and Jesus alone, He is our Ark of the Covenant. Hallelujah. He is our new covenant. He is the mediator of that covenant. He is life like the bud, the budded rod of Aaron, and he is the bread of life, like the manna in the wilderness. So he is our prophet, our priest, and our coming king. 